Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Hello, my name is Dr. Clarence W. Longbottom, Christian apologist and expert on the Bible, the divinely inspired, inerrant, perfect word of God. You might be asking yourself, if God truly wanted to communicate clearly and effectively to hundreds and hundreds of billions of people across thousands of years, thousands of miles, thousands of locations, cultures, languages, and uh, very levels of education and intelligence, from the most vast intellects to the most limited, from the most technologically advanced societies to the least, to every single man, woman, and child, both past and present, why exactly would he choose to deliver his commands, laws, parables, lessons, and teachings in a Bronze Age document written by unverifiable authors in a language that requires subjective interpretation by fallible humans into thousands of different and sometimes conflicting translations, which then require someone like me, an apologist, to provide an explanation? Ha <laughs> ha! I actually cover this very question in Chapter 7 of my latest book, available for only $29.99 in hardcover at Amazon.com, entitled Apologists Putting the Semen Back in Seminary. The first mistake the uh, <clears throat> common people make is attempting to simply pick up a Bible, open it, read it, and understand exactly what it means. How ridiculous! God's vastly superior intellect cannot be simply understood. No, no. Proper understanding must come from a proper pedigree, which is why I hold several degrees in the field of biblical interpretation, including a BS, an MDIV, PhD, MA, BA, MBA, FDIC, KPBO, VHS, DVD, and Blu-ray. Let us begin with a specific example of why the Bible makes perfect sense when observed through the analytical lens of the apologist. <clears throat> Jesus speaks in Matthew 19.24. He says, And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Aha! Your first thought is that it is impossible for a camel, a large lumbering beast, to fit through the teeny eye of a sewing needle. It simply cannot be done. And naturally, your assumption would be that being rich automatically condemns someone to hell. After all, since passage through the eye of the needle is impossible for the camel, passage into heaven would be impossible for the wealthy. But ah, you've made a common mistake. You've attempted to read the Bible literally. And this is where apologetics swoops in to save the day. Let us look at Matthew 19.24 again. This time, using the interpretive tools that I and a few select others in the more <clears throat> privileged parts of the world possess. It says, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, we begin with the word camel. You might think it refers to the large, lumbering, desert-dwelling creature with giant humps on its back. But proper examination of the original Greek, crossed reference with the historical writings of the time period, reveals that the word camel translates into something much different. Two thousand years ago, it meant literally, man with extremely muscular thighs. And the word I uh, it's actually a derivative of the Hebrew word ayatya, which means uh, any orifice or opening. Any orifice at all. Um, um, <coughs> uh, finally, casual readers of scripture often misinterpret the word needle, 
taken from the Aramaic Milos, which at the time in Judea was the common name for the town's most popular prostitute. So you see, given the correct context, the idea of a camel entering the eye of a needle seems not just possible, but probably a frequent event, seeing how most of the early Judean wives were often mistaken for livestock. Yes, without the aid of the apologist, the average man, woman, and child would have completely missed the point, and they'd no doubt be attempting to cram thousands of rich people through a metaphor no larger than the head of a pin. And anyone falling into a high enough tax bracket, no matter how much prayer, penitence, and sacrifice would be destined to roast for all eternity simply because they committed the unforgivable sin of being successful. Oh, the Bible promotes prosperity in other verses? Well, sure. Uh, Romans 8.32 says, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Uh, contradiction? Not if you look at the scripture in a different context, in another language, with yet another translation, cross-referencing the New Testament with the Old Testament, examining the author's background and the writing style, turning the Bible upside down, grasping firmly to the cover, holding it out in front of your chest and shaking vigorously. Let this be a lesson to you. The next time you want to understand the message that God wants everyone to uh, understand, there's nothing like summoning the services of the apologist. Not only do we possess incredible insight, education, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma, but we're available to speak at your next religious conference or event. Uh, for a fee. Mm. Uh, not too big a fee, though. <laughs> After all, uh, there's a, a minuscule chance I might have possibly uh, interpreted this particular Bible story incorrectly, and uh, <laughs> uh, there's no way someone as hefty as myself could ever fit through the eye of a needle. And my special thanks out to William Knight, who is one of the single best character voices in the business for allowing me to use him for my intro. I actually had a more produced version of it. And I'm thinking about doing actually a video version of, of that bit. I know it's absurd, and that's the point. We're talking about the backflips, the acrobatics that the experts and the apologists must use to explain away what is the nonsensical. My thanks out to William because the guy is just amazingly talented. Apologist, what does it mean? A person who makes a defense in speech or writing of a belief or idea. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language says the apologist is, quote, a person who argues in defense or justification of something, such as a doctrine, policy, or institution. And the apologist is the defender, the champion, the one who's going to explain it to the rest of us. And because he or she seems to be incredibly adept at stretching and bending and twisting and equivocating. I like to call this particular brand of expert the apologist acrobat. And apologists come in a wide spectrum. In fact, on the subject of biblical apologetics, I saw a YouTube debate with Michael Shermer, and he listed many of the types of experts out there who agree there is a God but disagree on everything else. I mean, there's flat earthers, geocentrists, young earth creationists, old earth creationists, gap creationists, those are the people that say there are millions of years between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. The day-age creationists, those are the ones who say that the actual days of creation weren't days, they were millions of years. Progressive creationists, evolutionary creationists, you heard this one? Evolution's true, but God did it. Theistic creationists, that's the intelligent design argument. Materialistic evolutionists, the list goes on and on and on. Now, in this particular discussion in this show, because Christianity is my background, because this show is being broadcast from the buckle of the Bible Belt in America, I'm going to deal specifically with apologists and the Christian scriptures. And I know that frustrates some people who want me to cover all these different types of religions, but because this is my passion, my background, it is where my focus simply lies. And it is very relevant for those of us here in America. If you are living in another part of the country, I still want you to hang on and listen, because this stuff will fascinate you. And if you, re if you examine the scriptures closely, you will see why they require acrobatics. <laughs> 
to keep from just coming off as another widely ridiculous or horribly offensive story. Cue the experts. Now, I know I talk about the Noah's Ark story a lot. I know. I bring it up almost every show, and I'm sorry. But understand that I do so because it was one of the catalysts for me in my own questioning of the scriptures. Now, Next to the creation story and the crucifixion story, the flood story is arguably the most recognizable story in the Bible. Everybody knows it. If you consider the Bible the perfect, accurate, infallible, divinely inspired word of God, and you can prove that this one story is bogus, in my opinion... It provides legitimate grounds to dismiss every other story, every other claim the Bible makes. No picking and choosing here, folks. You don't get to cherry pick. No hand selecting which parts of the Bible we accept and which ones we simply just <laughs> just kind of skip by. In my opinion, if you can show definitively that the account of Noah's Ark is complete and total BS, you have effectively brought the entire Bible to its knees. And it is here at the story of the Great Flood, that one can immediately see how the apologist's work is cut out for him. Genesis chapter 16, verses 19 through 21. Noah rounds up two of every sort of animal. That number changes to seven animals in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Okay, the apologist starts to explain it to us. Some animals were clean, some were unclean, some were for what? Food? For sacrifice? Bears, in case one of them died on the journey. Okay, whatever. Of course, even with God's help, it would be impossible to round up and accommodate all the millions of species of the world's animals. Now, instead, according to the apologist, Noah didn't round up species. He rounded up the different kinds of animals. According to some experts, this brings the number from the millions down to, oh, let's just pick a number, 16,000 or so kinds of animals. Dr. Max Yontz is a pastor and apologist in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. He has said that everything about the Noah's Ark story can be explained. For example, regarding the number of animals on the ark, he calculates from Genesis chapter 6, verse 15, that the 450-foot ark was equivalent in size to, quote, 522 standard stock cars or eight freight trains of 65 cars each. Racing fans, he's not talking about stock cars. He's talking about train cars. Space wasn't a problem, according to this man's argument. In fact, he stipulates you could fit all of the Earth's insect and worm species in 21 boxcars. Two modern-day trains comprised of 73 cars could carry about 35,000 animals. So loading up the ark with kinds of critters seems like no problem. Wouldn't the boat buckle under the weight of all the animals, wouldn't it sink? An article in the Skeptic's Dictionary regarding Noah's Ark listed one apologist argument that, quote, animals are mostly water, and water floats in water, so what's the problem? <laughs> well, if you dismiss that claim, we're talking about a large floating box that displaces, let's say, around 76,000 cubic feet of ocean, floating to half of its height. The ark's weight running just under 500 tons, 1,600 tons, just being the cargo, the animals and everything else, the food stores. The reason it did not sink, according to the apologist, the ark was bigger, the ark was lighter, the animals were fewer, the buoyancy of the water was greater, or my personal favorite, God reached down with his divine hand and just kept that boat afloat. Praise Jesus. Let's go with the apologist's argument. That the ark housed only the kinds of animals and not all the species. Okay, all right, fine. Let's go there. By this reasoning, if we pick an animal, let's pick an animal, the dog. Two dogs walked off of the ark and then they procreated and somehow produced every variation, every breed of dog we see today. That's right. Two dogs of a single kind over a mere 4,000 years produced everything. The Labrador, the Boxer, the German Shepherd, the Dotson, the Beagle, Doberman, Terrier, the Collie, Dalmatian, Spaniel, Greyhound, Pekingese, the Pit Bull, Sharpe, Chinese Pug, Bull, Mastiff, Irish Setter, the Toy Poodle, you name it. It all came from one dog. Now remember, the same apologist that questioned speciation and, and branching in the evolutionary model 
They reject it, right? They embrace the idea that, say, oh, I don't know, a German shepherd walked off the ark and immediately became the great, 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 great grandfather of the miniature Yorkie. If you're an apologist, you got to make sure you're nice and limber for this stuff. If you continue to bend, the stretching just might cause injury. If the Noah's Ark story is true, it means it, it could be traced, observed, proven that all of the world's animal species, dogs and everything else, originally or, originated in Turkey. And you would see evidence of their generational line leading all the way from Mount Ararat to their modern day habitats all around the world. That's right, folks. The polar bear traveled on foot from the desert migrating to Alaska, Canada, Russia, Greenland, and Norway. There's a website called ChristianAnswers.net. They explain this. Are you ready? Land bridges. Major tectonic upheavals accompanied by the rising and the falling of the sea floors, along with an ice age caused by the global flood. The lowered sea levels made it possible for animals to simply walk it. They just walked, migrating over land bridges for centuries. There's stipulation that the planet's continents were at one time all connected. And like the beetles, they broke up because the pressure was just too great. Ask the apologist a legitimate common sense question. And just watch him become the human pretzel. How did eight human beings, back, still back to the Ark story, how did eight human beings over 500 years old Feed and maintain 16,000 kinds of animals. Who had the unpleasant job of shoveling out the countless tons of waste, of excrement, of poo out of each compartment up to that little tiny window? Remember, it only had one. How did Noah accommodate the specialized diets for the animals like, say, oh, the giant panda? Did they have stores of bamboo shoots just hanging around the Middle East? Somebody go to the fridge. I've got some stored over there. When the herbivores walked off the ark and all the plant life was destroyed, right? It was all destroyed in the flood. These animals eat plants. When they got off the ark, what did they eat? Mud? What about the carnivores? What did they eat if the only prey animals were the ones that were protected and God just spared? When the lions, like, yelling at the rabbits, you know, hurry up and procreate, we're starving over here. <laughs> How exactly did the marine life survive the flood if the rains flooded the earth? Mixing the fresh water with the salt water, that would make the ocean a hostile environment, unlivable for both fresh water and salt water creatures. They'd be dead. If Noah and his family were the only ones spared and the only humans left on earth, eight people, and they practiced incest to repopulate the planet, where did all the different races and ethnicities of human beings come from? A Middle Eastern family provided the genetic foundation for more than 5,000 different ethnic groups in just a few hundred generations. Now, this is where the apologist quite often executes what I call the big finale, the showstopper. Big arguments, common sense arguments that you and I make in everyday conversation. The final round of theological twister usually ends up with one or both of two parts. Part one, the apologist says, well, <laughs> you can't take all the Bible literally. It's not. I mean, it's, it's inspired. They're stories. They're parables. They're parables. Come on. Part two, God can do whatever he wants. After all... He is God. Ta-da! Bam! Hello, that's it. Game over. The apologist has just laid waste to all of us naysayers and skeptics and critics. Ignore or gloss over biblical information that just doesn't jive. And remember that God can <laughs> do whatever he wants. He can pull whatever he wants out of his magic hat. End of debate. The apologist has won, and he goes back to congratulate himself. By the way, Regarding the Noah story, if you want to continue this skeptical examination of uh, of the tale, I suggest there's a book out by Robert A. Moore. It's called The Impossible Voyage of Noah's Ark, and it is fascinating. Now, of course, none of these arguments will ever deter the apologist. God's rules are not our rules. God is not required to make sense because his ways are not our ways. And His, for this reason, 
many otherwise intelligent people will continue to essentially defend the undefendable. Many intelligent people and Dr. Kent Hovind. (laughs) I have to bring him up. I have to bring him up, okay? Kent Hovind is the rock star of Christian apologetics. He holds three degrees in Christian education. He established the Creationism Science Evangelism Ministry way back in 1989. He's spoken, he's argued, and debated in favor of a young earth creation since the 80s. He has been known literally as Dr. Dino with a website, drdino.com, where he sold books and videotapes and replicas of fossils. He actually tried to use dinosaurs to prove creation. Website, I, I looked, it's still online. Uh, Hoven started the Dinosaur Adventureland Park. It's a young Earth creationist theme park located just behind his home in Pensacola, Florida. The park depicted humans and dinosaurs just hanging out together. Just coexisting, all is well. It also featured a depiction of the Loch Ness Monster. (laughs) The Skeptical Inquirer did a whole piece on this park back in 2004, and they said the park's message was blatantly deceptive. The park closed in 2009 until further notice. Ken Hoven, he pulled in millions of dollars, millions through speaking engagements and merchandising and what else, before he was imprisoned on 58 separate counts of tax evasion in January of 2007. Guy's in prison. Before that, the humble Kent Hovind owned at least 10 different properties, nine of which were seized by the government because he owed so much tax money on them. Defenders of the good Dr. Hovind say that he's a victim here. It's a secular conspiracy to just shut him up. It's the devil. He's been unfairly persecuted. There's even a website. They have an online petition to have this guy freed from jail at the Minimum Security Federal Correction Institution in Jessup, Georgia. The website is freehovind.com. They have over 11,000 signatures of people demanding this hero's release. Oh, yeah, I I called him Dr. Dr. Hovind. Yeah. Yeah, he was awarded correspondence degrees, an MA and PhD in Christian education from the non-accredited Patriot University in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is now known as uh, Patriot Bible University, and they've since relocated. Now, if you would, if you're listening to the pre-recorded version of this show, I want you to hit pause on this broadcast and Google search under images. I want you to type in Kent Hovind, H-O-V as in Victor, I-N-D, Kent Hovind, Patriot University. Type those four words into a Google search for images and take a look at what you find. Yes, the university looks suspiciously like a double-wide mobile home. There's even a Christian guy who called him out. Christian writer and radio host, his name is Steve Levikoff. He published a book back in 1993 called Name It and Frame It, New Opportunities in Adult Education and How to Avoid Being Ripped Off by Christian Degree Mills. And in this book, this guy specifically named Patriot University as a degree mill. They just crank them out. You want a PhD? Hey, we'll fix you up stating that the college awarded degrees to students based on all sorts of questionable standards like life experience and ministry evaluation, stuff that can't be quantified, Patriot University not recognized by the United States Department of Education or any similar organization, and the organization that did step in to accredit it, it's called the American Accrediting Association of Theological Institutions, AAATI. That's a mouthful. They were exposed by a reporter from the St. Petersburg Times as an accreditation mill. Accrediting schools for hundred bucks. Hundred dollar fee. Even Hobbin's doctoral dissertation's been just skewered by the intellectual community for just being incomplete, with lousy spelling. There's no table of contents, no page numbers, horrible grammar, no title, an unfinished index, even an illustration in the thesis cut with scissors out of a science book he found and pasted in. There's a doctor named is Dr. Karen Bartelt, uh, possesses a PhD in organic uh, she possesses a Ph.D. in organic chemistry from Montana State University. I believe she was teaching in Illinois last I heard. 
and you can find her on YouTube. Her uh, It's Karen Bartelt, B-A-R-T-E-L-T. She wrote a scathing review of Hovind's thesis in an article called The Dissertation Kent Hovind Doesn't Want You to Read. If you can find it, look into it. It's brilliant. All right, fine. So what does he believe? What truth does Kent Hovind promote? From his own bio on the uh, Dr. Dino website. Quote, After teaching high school science for 15 years and speaking on the creation-evolution subject thousands of times, I can say with all certainty that the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. The universe was created in six literal 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. Modern science textbooks are wrong about the age of the Earth and the place dinosaurs hold in history. Dinosaurs were created with man and were on the ark with Noah. After the flood, the climate changed, making the environment unfavorable for dinosaurs' survival. Additionally, they were hunted to the point of extinction in most parts of the world by man. A few dinosaurs are still alive in various parts of the world today. Unquote. According to his own Hovind theory, his own kind of manifesto, this guy believes the Earth is 6,000 years old. Younger than the Sumerian civilization. He believes that the Earth's current population could be generated beginning with eight people in less than 4,000 years. And if humankind truly began much earlier than that, we'd all be choked with overpopulation here on the planet. Hovind believes radiometric dating, bogus. The entire geologic column, bogus. Because he says it's based on the assumption that evolution's true. So the entire geological column was designed as a conspiracy to discredit the scriptures. It's an attack of Satan. Hovind believes the slowing of the Earth's rotation provides proof that the Earth is young. He ignores the fact the actual rate of decay is like 0.005 seconds a year over 4.6 billion years. That counts for, accounts for about a 14-hour day. <laughs> it's, it's nothing. He believes because the oldest tree in the world is apparently 4,300 years old. Tree ring dating proves that the Earth is young. How the life of a tree proves the creation of the planet story is not clear. He believes evolution by natural selection means everything came to be by chance. You're going to hear that word often from the apologist. Chance. Which ignores the entire basis of natural selection. Modification of specific traits over time. He also believes the burden of proof is on the evolutionist. He calls evolution a religion. He also calls mathematics a religion, by the way. He's offered 25, I'm sorry, he's offered $250,000 to anyone who can prove the theory of evolution. Of course, given the nature of his convictions, his definition of proof might be quite different than yours or mine. I don't know what his release date is. (laughs) You want to get frustrated? Watch a debate with this guy. And he is slick. He's smooth. He's really a car salesman. And he's... It's almost a foot soldier tactic. You know, the personality types I talk about, the feeler, the theologian, the folklorist, and the foot soldier. Well, obviously, he's going to be a theologian. He's an apologist. But he's also a foot soldier in the fact that he just tramples you with sheer force of verb. He's just boom, boom, boom. He's just a – he's extremely fluid. And people who don't bother to do their homework will hear a guy like him or any other apologist, and they'll think, wow, they must know what they're talking about. Why do we bother to speak out against these people? Because they are influencing what our children are being taught about the world, the galaxy, the universe we live in. And I believe in my heart they are limiting what people can become. Imagine those children walking through the Creation Museum or this dino park in Pensacola or whatever, and as a very young person... The assumptions they make about the world they live in are immediately wrong. Think of what they have to overcome in the years ahead. Think about what they will be one day teaching to their children and generations after that. I had a message in, a message from uh, Richard on my Facebook page. It said, in a conversation with a young evangelical lady, she mentioned that Adam and Eve named all of the species as God brought the creatures before the couple. Remember, he named the animals. I pointed out, among other things, the vast number of species on the earth and the implausibility of such a claim, giving that at one species per second, I was feeling generous, it would still take nearly 60 days nonstop to name them all. (laughs) 
this would not fit into the literal week of creation. And her answer was, well, maybe God let them have super fast speech like an auctioneer. <laughs> And it's what about what about and hey, there's a zebra. <laughs> Uh, Patrick sent me an email. It says, some of my personal favorite arguments from Theist are, I have a right to my opinion. The first cause argument, what caused the Big Bang? The ontological fallacy that states that if, you know, if we can conceive of God, he must exist. And of course, you weren't there, so you don't know. <sighs> Bill sends me a message. It says, a few weeks ago, there was a rainbow outside. And someone said it was proof the Bible was real. Because in the Bible, God turned someone into a rainbow. God turned someone into a rainbow. <laughs> and we still have rainbows to this day. I think this is the sort of hogwash religions used to entrap stupid people. She insisted there were no rainbows before. And it was the only reason we have them now. She completely ignored science in favor of her faith in the Bible. Serafina, what a great name. Serafina sent me a message. It said, My all-time favorite in Christian apologetics is when a horrible or just downright bizarre passage from the Old Testament is mentioned, especially when mentioned by someone they know to not be a believer. They'll say, well, it doesn't really matter anymore because when Jesus came with the New Testament, everything changed. These will usually be the same people who use that well-known passage from Leviticus to condemn homosexuality, right? They roll back to the Old Testament to talk about how homosexuality is evil. But of course, when you bring anything else in the Old Testament that is nonsensical or offensive, then the OT is null and void, and it's the New Covenant. She says, I don't think I've ever come across a Christian who actually believed that they were supposed to just completely ignore the Old Testament. Oh, I have. <laughs> I met a bunch of them. She says, even though they might say it when challenged, furthermore, why is it even in the Bible if it's not important anymore? If it's supposed to be just sort of, well, you know, it was a different time, different culture, different laws. Why is it in there? Jesus also references the Old Testament in the New Testament, so wouldn't taking it out just prove that you don't really follow the word of your own God and you're just picking and choosing, Serafina? Thanks for the uh, message. Travis sends me a quote from uh, Robert Green Ingersoll regarding Adam and Eve. Let me quote this directly. It says, Does anybody now believe in the story of the serpent? I pity any man or woman who in this 19th century believes in that childish fable. Why did Adam and Eve disobey? Why? They were tempted. By whom? The devil. Who made the devil? God. What did God make him for? Why did he not tell Adam and Eve about this serpent? Why did he not watch the devil instead of watching Adam and Eve? Instead of turning them out, why did he not keep him from getting in? Why did he not have his flood first and drown the devil before he made a man and a woman? The best quote from Ingersoll is this, quote, If I did not want a man to eat my fruit, I would not put him in my orchard. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Area code 630. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Hey, my name's Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for calling. What do you got for me on the subject of the apologist acrobat today? Well, my fiancé's grandma is very, very religious, and she said something to him a couple of months ago. She said, you know, science is getting to the point where it's proving what we religious people have known for so long. And I was just like, what? No. No, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. And did you engage? Did you actually have a conversation, or did you just roll your eyes and move on? Oh, well, uh, it's kind of hard with her to even talk about it. She's convinced her own husband, who died, is in hell because he didn't go to church enough. What a prison that must be. For the rest of her life, she thinks about Dad. a person she loved in eternal torment. It just breaks my heart to think about it. Yeah, it's pretty sad, and I wish that we could have more of a relationship with her, but, you know, she's on my Facebook always being like, well, you will see the light, and, you know, God's love will make you happy someday. It's like, you need to be quiet, please. So. Hey, I'm glad you called, Ashley. Thank you so much for being a part of the show this morning. I very much appreciate it. Thanks for hosting. Tom sent me an email. He said, one of my friend's ex-wives once told me that she believes the fossils of dinosaurs were just random bones of various other animals placed together. We talked about this argument a few minutes ago. She also believed the earth was flat. <laughs> and the whole story of it being round was a myth perpetrated by the scientific community solely to disprove God. 
is that true, Tom? She believes the earth is flat? What, are you kidding? Area code 585, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I didn't know <laughs> if you had answered my phone call or not. I'll answer your call anytime. What do you want to talk about? Well, I've been listening to people talk um, about those who are believers, and I am not a believer. However, I would say that we need to have more respect for people's beliefs and not to ridicule people because they believe in that, because I think inherently there is something within our DNA that makes people want to believe in something that's bigger than themselves. And uh, just like a child who does know better, you being a good parent, you don't scold a child because they haven't learned something. And I believe that we shouldn't scold or belittle or ridicule people who have a strong faith. I agree and disagree. I mean, I hate to be okay, a politician on it, but let me tell you where I fall on that. I don't believe just because you hold a belief system, I have to respect it. I just bogus. I mean, if you come to me, if you came to me and you said, I believe the earth is flat, I don't have to respect that just because you hold the belief. Why? Now, I'm not speaking about whether or not I should respect you or should approach you with kid gloves or kindness or, or, or what have you. But if you come to me with some ridiculous, nonsensical argument, if a Scientologist walked in the room five minutes from now and gave me their BS story about Xenu and all of us having our inner Satan, <laughs> I don't have to respect that just because they hold the opinion. Hell no. In fact, ridicule and mockery, mockery does have its place. Some ideologies, some religions, some belief systems are so outrageous they deserve to be be exposed, sometimes using facts, sometimes figures, sometimes I use sarcasm, satire, and mockery. I do think that we need to do a better job of dealing with the actual people. And I know the atheist community is extremely guilty of looking down our kind of uh, elitist nose at the rest of the world, saying all of you in the trough are stupid, you're religiotard, you're creatard, and, and they immediately reduce otherwise good people to caricatures. I think we have a real job ahead of us when it comes to dealing with the people. But you're, you're I don't have to hold up a Bible and say, I respect this. I just don't. Yeah. However, you're never going to uh, change or in in change people's minds or enlighten them if you ridicule their beliefs. Um, I am a strong believer that all opinions are equally as valid, no matter how off the wall they are. Whether you want to accept them or not is one thing but they're equally as, as valid. And a, a very good one that, that disgusts me is the Westboro Baptist Church. However, um, do I respect their opinion? Absolutely. Do I respect them or what they're doing? Absolutely not. I think they're disgusting. However, I am not going to change their mind by ridiculing them. And I think perhaps that's one of the problems we have in American society today that we don't know how to hold a discourse, how to communicate in a manner that we don't start yelling or satirizing or belittling other people. And I think that that's one of, one of the problems we have in American discourse today, whether we're talking about politics or social policy. I'd like to word it differently. If you're going to talk about the Westboros or the Nazi Party or what have you, I, I don't like this phrasing it that I respect your opinion. I think I would say that I support the Constitution and your freedom to have an opinion, however atrocious it may be, but I don't have to respect or support it. I mean, I, I understand your larger point that I, you know, if, if free speech is going to be um, the, le the letter of the law, the law of the land, if it's going to be how we conduct ourselves, if I'm going to want freedom to be able to go out and, and make the argument against God, I need to support the law that says that you have every right to hold your opinion. But if Westboro goes out and protests the funeral of someone who was killed in battle or the child of, of, of you know, loving parents or, or whatever their agenda mm -hmm. may be, respect doesn't enter my vernacular. I, respect is not even in my zip code. They, have, they don't earn it. Yeah, I, I, I will never. But, but I think, I think you're, you're uh, confusing actions with beliefs. You can hold an opinion. You can hold a belief and act or not act on those. That's the difference between uh, bigotry and racism. 
uh, bigotry is holding a belief, racism is acting on those beliefs. Well, what good is a belief so, system if you don't act it out, if you don't have it manifest, if you don't, if you'll pardon the biblical term, bear fruit in your own life, then you're just an armchair quarterback. Well, listen, if, I believe that there's life on other planets. I can't act on that because I don't have a spaceship. So, I mean, that argument doesn't play either. But if you hold a worldview... Don't you live that worldview? Don't you stand up against what you believe is wrong and stand up for what you believe is right? Don't you put your belief or your the facts or your worldview into action in your own life? Yes, I do. Well, I take your larger point that we need to probably do a better job as free thinkers of creating an environment that is not a hostile environment for the men and women we encounter in everyday life. I will defend the occasional skewering of a Kent Hovind or someone who is such a caricature, who is so damaging, who is so influential, and a belief system that is so ridiculous that they must be exposed. And sometimes yeah, my I know talk is, just, yeah. is to call them out and just make fun of them. <laughs> just, uh-huh. I just make fun of them sometimes. But I will say, whatever satire or mockery you hear with me, whether it's in any of my videos, the Noah's Ark videos or the Christian East videos, underneath that tone are... Real solid, good uh, pieces of information that you can you can take, examine, scrutinize, and uh, and be critical of. I mean, information is there underneath it. I, if I may come to my own defense, just, okay? Yes, but we need to be respectful, even in our satire. Do you think I should respect Westboro? I think you need to respect the beliefs. You don't have to. Um, approve of of their actions. Look, if if I had a child, my child was killed in battle or whatever. I had a funeral and Westboro was picketing the funeral of my child. I shouldn't vehemently protest. And again, again, I think what I'm trying to do as a teacher, you know, I try to explain to to my college students that there is a difference between holding beliefs and then acting on those beliefs. And do those actions hurt others? And therefore, do you need to think about or readjust your beliefs so it doesn't hurt others? So I think, to me, there is a difference between holding a belief and acting on those beliefs. And um, I see Westboro Baptist Church as a scourge. Um, I would never in a million years condone anything that they do, those actions, but I do hold respect for the fact that they have a right to have those beliefs. But I'm not saying that they, they have to act on I don't think they should act on those beliefs. Hold your beliefs, believe in your beliefs, go to your church, do your own thing, but don't don't pass it on to others. Don't pass your beliefs on to others. So for me, there's a difference between thinking and acting. That's I think I take your larger point. You and I stand uh, in disagreement, I think, about where action comes into play. But it, it, I appreciate and your call. And we can agree I, to disagree without being disagreeable. I buy that, and you and I just did it. I mean, you and I we're, <laughs> you and I are still pals, aren't we? <laughs> I don't oh, see, absolutely. I don't hear any malice in your voice or mine. You and I managed to disagree, and at the end of the day, let's go have coffee, okay? Thanks All for the call. Right. I appreciate I'll it. I'll hold you to that. All right. Take care. <laughs> I actually did a, uh, uh, a post on my Facebook page a while back. We were talking about whatever topic came to mind, and I see this so much. I mean, we talk about the religious being intolerant, but we as the atheist community, if, it, if something comes up about politics or about global warming or about conservation or about uh, whether you're an atheist or a, a, a polytheist or a, a whatever, <laughs> whatever your, your point of view is, I mean, you get that many opinions in a room, nobody's going to agree on everything. What happens, though, is you find some people who do what she and I just did. We have a direct conversation. We see it from opposing points of view or differing points of view, and we end the conversation still friends. You know, hey, all right, fine. I'll tell you what, I'll continue to look for truth and seek information and get the facts and be educated, and I will take an honest journey toward whatever the answer is if you promise to do the same. And at the end of the day, let's go get sushi. You know, I'll take a spicy yellowtail, some hot tea, miso soup. I'll take it, you know. What I don't like are the people that have a disagreement, and because I don't agree with you, you shut down. Oh, yeah, well, screw you. I'm out of here.
fine. You're wrong. I'm right. You're stupid. I'm smart. You see this all the time. Just monitor my uh, comment section on the YouTube pages. People do it to each other all the time. You're an idiot. You're not even. You're you're a waste of my breath. You're retarded. People are totally cruel to each other because they have a disagreement. What I really appreciate are those who get it, who know how to disagree. And at the end of the day, we're all complex people and we can disagree. I do believe there are some belief systems out there deserving of mockery and ridicule. And I will mock them. 207, hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Hi there, my name is Amanda. Okay, I write an organization called Free Thinkers of the World. Freethinkersoftheworld.com if anyone wants to go check it out. And I'm not actually calling to to do to say that, but, not. <laughs> but no, it's good you're to not chilling for your website. No. Mm-mm. Amanda, what do you got for me? What's <laughs> going on? Um, I grew up a Jehovah's Witness and unfortunately. And um they were very uh, it was very controlling. Very, very controlling. And um they had a lot of really, really scary beliefs, like after um there was going to be an Armageddon, and after Armageddon, there was going to be a paradise earth that the dead that were Jehovah's Witnesses were going to be resurrected onto. Now, I have friends and family who are still witnesses, and I tried to argue this with them. I am very, very into science. I am a very logical, rational thinker. I study anthropology, archaeology in school, and I just I don't know what I'm supposed to say to these people. When I'm constantly like, how do you how do you rebuttal something so ridiculous and, and with no scientific evidence at all? And they also have their own book uh, on called Evolution or Creation. It's ridiculous the way they describe things. They make they make a joke out of science. It's unbelievable. Science what is a conspiracy, thoughts? you know. Science is. The, all the scientists, first of all, science can't agree with itself. I hear this one all the time. Science doesn't know anything. It can't agree with itself on anything, which is totally bogus. There are actually peer reviews, and, and I mean, there are scientists hold each other accountable as much or more, in my opinion, than anybody else. You publish a scientific paper somewhere, you have the entire worldwide scientific community going to come after you and check your facts. You know, exactly. you know I think I think accountability exists and thrives in the scientific world. Uh, the second thing is, is that if science and uh, the Bible don't jive, then they decide that God doesn't have to exist inside the parameters of our physical world, and he can do whatever he wants. His rules are different. His entity, his whoever he is, doesn't have to abide by the same laws that we do. Oh, it totally is. Um, yeah, I just, uh, the last lady who called, though, I didn't understand in a way. I mean, I try to remain passive, logical, neutral as best as I can. But it's unreasonable for me to think that the Westboro Baptist Church, and I'm friends with um, with Nathan Phelps, who's an atheist, and he used to be in Westboro Baptist Church. Well, he was raised, but he wasn't there really by choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. He, um, I don't know how anyone can defend that or even say they could respect that in any way, even in a constitutional way. I'm sorry, I know we have our constitutional rights here in the U.S., but I don't see that, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's it's full of how I grew up, it was full of abuse. A lot of people who ran away from the religion were kidnapped and brought back by force. I mean, I don't see how you can respect things like this. I mean, should we respect the KKK? No, I don't I don't understand these people's way of thinking. Amanda, maybe like, so she's how, using respect know. in a different way, though. I think her way is, you know, you got to let them be, is what she's thinking. And that's not how I determine respect. I, I, I think respect is that I have to give you... Uh, I have to give you credibility. <laughs> well, you've got a valid right. argument. Uh, not at all. I, I despise Westboro. I don't want to derail the, the whole show on that subject. But um, I think if if I'm a moral person, I can't sit back and allow them to do what they do, to indoctrinate children, to create a culture or cult of of abuse, of, of lies, of disruption, of pain. Uh, I have to. I, I, as a moral person, should be on the front lines as an atheist, standing up to say I disagree vehemently with what these people are about, and here's why. And uh, yeah. because because I'm a moral person, I, I think I, I must. I'm compelled to live and act my belief system. Otherwise, what good am I? You know. Right. A little sermon yeah, there. Sorry. Be... <laughs> Sorry. No, that's, that's all right. I ser- I sermon people all the time, and they're like, shut up, Amanda. But, uh, <laughs> Thanks for but, the call, um, Amanda. I'm going to move on, okay? Yeah. T- okay, take care. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, I had a message from um, Amy. It said, I read an article about the Creation Museum. They claim the T-Rex had sharp teeth to crack open coconuts. Oh, yeah. You know what? I have an article on that very thing. That article, I think, came out last week. This is beautiful. If you're an apologist, how do you sleep at night? It was a May 6th article in the Digital Journal. The headline read, T-Rex ate coconuts, <laughs> says Creation Museum. Uh, uh, a person named uh, Sarda Sani, S-A-H-N-E-Y, uh, wrote an article about it for Science 2.0. I'll just read an excerpt. It says, it seems Noah solved the problem of fitting dinosaurs into his vessel by only taking baby dinosaurs. <laughs> Indeed, the Ark has a detailed display of many animals happily boarding the boat. Dinosaurs cavort with giraffes, penguins, hippos, and bears. Museum guides tell visitors that before Adam and Eve were expelled from paradise, all of the dinosaurs were peaceful plant eaters. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, God gives the green herb to every creature to eat. And so there were no predators. When a curious museum visitor asked why exactly the T-Rex had six-inch long serrated teeth, I think they're longer than that, the guides go on to explain that the T-Rex used his big teeth to open coconuts. Apparently it was only after Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of paradise that the dinosaurs started to eat flesh. She says, my opinion is, I think the people who built this museum are smoking a, a bit too much green herb. <laughs> the Creation Museum is a whole show in itself, isn't it? Let's talk to area code 208. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Good morning. Who's this? Hey, hey Seth. How you doing? This is Peter. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, I just thought I'd uh, call and share a little excerpt that I got from you, or that I got the other day on Facebook uh, from... An apologist. It was kind of interesting comparing Jesus to Hitler. I thought you'd be interested to hear this one. I would like to. Um, yeah, it's too bad the guy from last week didn't call back too, telling us uh, how we're closer to God than. He, he may still people. get through. I got my eyes open here, so. So <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Somebody invoked Hitler. Tell me what they said. Uh, yeah, here's what they said. We were having a discussion on Facebook, you know, about religion, and you know, he wrote this. At what point does history cease to be historic? Is it after 100 years, 1,000? Apparently, it doesn't extend all the way to 2,000. I wonder if it's still historic after 1,800 years. When do we erase the memory of our historic hard drive, start fresh, and begin to pretend that everything that happened prior to that date is a myth, an unsubstantiated rumor? I mean, by that logic, in 3950 AD, assuming the planet still survives, we will deny that the Holocaust ever happened simply because the records from the 1900s aren't the same as what we have that day. And it's logically absurd to believe that one man could have killed upwards of 11 million people. It seems like an exaggeration, if there is such a man as Hitler, which some would believe that there probably was not, that he was merely a figment of someone's imagination and spoken for for hundreds of years until one day people believed all the rumors as folklore and, and, and the folklore is history. Then he couldn't have possibly have done such things that, that were attributed to him. It's simply too fantastical of a story. Or let me stop you. Say that, you know, let me stop you. Hang on. Yeah. Is this a Christian or a religious person stating that Hitler did not exist? No, he's saying that, you know, in 2,000 years, it's like, what's the cutoff? You know, how long does it have to take before something so old that it's not believable? Like, trying to say that, you know, I, I didn't believe the story of Christ because it's too old or that atheists deny it because it's, you know, it's been so long. I mean, no one's saying that Hitler flew on magic unicorns or, you know, turned water into wine or anything. But, you know, he, he also present, presented the argument that, you know, if Jesus was bullshit, then why would, you know, so many people kill themselves for what, what he said and what he believed? And I responded, well, you know, a lot more people were willing to kill themselves for what Hitler believed. Does that make him right? That's an interesting take. Thanks for the call. I do appreciate it very much. No problem. Take care, Seth. Well, usually when I hear it, uh, Hitler invoked, it is that Hitler was an atheist and that because he believed in evolution, he was trying to propagate positive straight. Uh, he was trying to propagate positive traits that he wanted to eliminate what he considered the detritus that was evolutionary. Of course, it's not. It's eugenics. It's a whole other deal. And Hitler was raised a Catholic and embraced God and invoked God, even in Mein Kampf. Of course, you bring that up to the uh, religious person who has not done their homework, and that becomes wildly inconvenient, and they usually skip by it and bring up Stalin. Let's talk to area code 810. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Anthony. 
What's going on, Anthony? Uh, not much. I want to give you my most annoying argument that I've ever gotten before. Come on, bring it up. Science doesn't know because it wasn't there. I actually wrote this one down. That's brilliant. I probably hear it all the time. Like, you Science don't really wasn't there. Know. How do you know what caused the Big Bang? You weren't there. <laughs> and you can't prove it. And my response to that was, you can't prove that there isn't an invisible leprechaun on my head dancing Macarena right now. What happens when you invoke something like that, or the invisible pink unicorn, or the flying spaghetti monster, when you relate it to their belief in an invisible god, they look at you regarding the FSM and they go, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> that's just stupid. Who would believe in an, a spaghetti monster? That's just dumb. God, he's real. Next? <laughs> exactly. Anthony, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Yep. Uh, let's talk to area code 407 on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Who's this? Uh, hey, this is Nam. Uh, tell me your name again. Nam. And Nam. I called Nam. like two podcasts ago. What's going on? Oh, man. I woke up today. I realized it's 11.51. I freaked out, and I called as soon as I could. You freaked out because you were missing the show? Yes, yes. And this is two of them. And I, I was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to miss this one. Well, what do you have for me this morning? Do you have an example of an um, apologist acrobatic in your world? I did last year, and she, she's a good friend of mine. You know, she's Filipino, and we were arguing in the band room in class. And then she says, you know, the age-old argument of there are no fossils to support it. And at that point, I knew that I was, it was going to be a long, long day. And then um, and she said, you can't disprove God. That is always something everybody has heard at least once, pretty sure. Prove he and doesn't exist. Prove that. Exa exactly. You can't, you know, it's, um, it's like you don't, well, you can technically. But there are, when you have like a God that, like a deist God, you can't really disprove that because you don't know anything about him. You don't know if he's stupid or if he's smart or if he's tall or if he's short or if he's a guy or he's a girl. But, like, with the Christian guy, that's different. I guess you could disprove his existence by, not by, like, physical, but, like, what's in the Bible, what they say, the Bible says, what God says, and he sounds pretty stupid there. What was I going to say? You ever do that? Yeah, I had this right, this nugget of information right here on the tip of my tongue. All like, the time. It just, I'm just, I just sat there like I had a stroke. I'm just, ah. <laughs> what was I going to say? Hey, man, I appreciate the call, though. Thank you so much. Yeah, you too. There's so much content to cover when it comes to the apologist. I had uh, Brian send a message to me, and he said, when he talks to people who believe in the Bible, and he talks about God punishing people to eternal torment, which would make him the biggest sadist in the history of sadists, the greatest monster, an unimaginable creature who would do this to someone else, to roast the flesh from their bones without end forever. He says this to people, and the uh, response from the apologist is, God doesn't send people to hell. People freely choose to go to hell. People freely choose to separate themselves from God, and he gives them their wish. It's our fault. These same people believe that because Eve was tempted and Adam was tempted in the garden, and they succumbed to the temptation thousands of years ago, and they ate the fruit of the tree that God placed directly in their path and allowed the serpent to tempt them, these naive people, with, because of that one single act, in the mind of the apologist, it is proportional that we, their great, 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 whatever descendants, should be roasted in eternal fire forever. The most unimaginable black blackness and separation and agony and writhing and pain. We deserve it. We were born sinners because Adam and Eve sinned and ate one fruit in a garden. Thousands of years ago. To the apologist, this makes sense. It's just. If it was anyone else, let's say, let's go back to Hitler. If Hitler had roasted someone in a fire until they died, until their human life was consumed for any single act, we'd be on fire with outrage. 
We would be so aghast. We'd be protesting. People would be weeping tears. There'd be a mass cry of justice. There must be justice. If God does it, if Yahweh does it, that's it's okay. He's, he's God. He's just. He just has to. He has no choice. Area code 504. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Uh, my name is Beth. Hi, Beth. Thanks for calling. What's up? Um, I'm calling in response to the guy who did suggest that we might doubt Hitler's existence 2,000 years from now. You know, that's something I do hear from apologists a lot, which is caricatures of the atheist argument. We don't deny the Bible just because it's old. <laughs> we deny it because it's logically inconsistent, the stories within it are inconsistent, they are logically impossible given what we know about the real world. You know, Hitler, the story of that does not say one man did it, says a country did it with various people in complicity. We have multiple accounts that coalesce into a clear story that makes sense, that is consistent with what we know about the world. If we had that for God, despite it being 2,000 years old, we would doubt it less. You know, that's not the reason why we doubt it, just because it's old. It's because of the logical and natural inconsistencies within it. I went to... So you just uh, let that go by as like, oh, that's interesting, and I sort of had to... Come on, come on, keep me honest. Well, I'm, I mean, the truth is, is I don't catch everything, or I'm juggling papers, or I'm moving on to the next thing, and, and you're absolutely right. The, uh, the argument that I have heard, I actually went to a seminar with an apologist, and there were two things about that particular day that I keep with me. The first was, is his argument for the validity of Scripture was that for such an old document, there were an awful lot of manuscripts, and he, he, had, he talked about the Odyssey and some, some other famous literary works, and how by this time, time period, there were only five copies in manuscript form, and there were only ten copies in manuscript form. But look at the Bible. Only a hundred years after the life of Jesus, there were like 10,000 copies. How could it not be true if there were so many copies? And then of course, why don't they even match internally? Uh, I'm, I'm looking around going, what? Your story, match Mark's story. Yeah, well, I understand completely. There are some books where the chapters disagree with themselves within the chapter. Mm -hmm. I have some of these listed on my website. If you look at Bible Contradictions at thethinkingatheist.com, it's not a complete list, but there's a whole litany of examples of the Bible disagreeing with itself. I right. want to know why in the world I don't know who authored the Bible. They think they know who authored. It says Matthew here, and it says Mark here, and it says Luke here, but there's no way to verify. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Well, we think. <laughs> who, who wrote the book of Exodus? Well, we think. Uh, how in the world right. does that buttress a document? And I mean, uh, we disbelieve the Greek myths now. We disbelieve the Roman myths and the Norse myths. Not because there's a lack of documentation for them, but because they do not fit with what we know about the world. It's not just that they're old. They're old and asserting supernatural events. And until you can convince me somehow that those events are possible in any way in this world, I'm not going to take that as any literal description of history. And in that way, it does definitely differ from stories of the Holocaust. The Holocaust in no way invokes supernatural explanations. When you invoke explanations that are that far removed from what we know about the world, you have to have some extraordinary proof to back that up, not just a bunch of contradictory documents. I like your style. I'm glad you're on our side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this is actually my first podcast I've ever listened to. I follow you on Facebook, um, but the first time I've listened to the podcast. And found well, thanks it for putting up with me. And honestly, I'm glad you called. You're a great call. Participate at any time. And keep me honest out there, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you Thanks. very much. Bye. Let's talk uh, quickly to area code 505. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Good morning. What's your name? Uh, my name is Todd. Todd, what's going on? Hey, um, I found your show about a month and a half ago. been listening to all of them. Really, really find it very, very entertaining. Um, it's very good. Uh, Thank you. Anyway, um, a couple of days ago, actually, a friend of mine that I haven't seen in a while that's a very evangelical Christian type, I decided to kind of start a little debate with him. And um, I said to him, because he's very, he's very skeptical about, about every other aspect of life, except when it comes down to his faith. And so I said to him, I said, you know, based on your, your, your same level of thinking, I'm surprised that you're so religious. I'm surprised that you're not some sort of atheist. And his first 
his first comment that he said to me, which I thought was interesting, is he said, he said, you know, it's because you haven't accepted Jesus in your heart. And, sure, you require and, the Holy Spirit to, to, to comprehend the Word of God. You have to have the, the guiding of the Spirit. Otherwise, you stand on the outside. You're outside the bubble. You can't. You won't ever get it. I've heard this argument before. Well, how'd you reply? You know, you know, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really have anything to say to that because, you know, actually, I wasn't. I wasn't raised Christian. Um, it's something that's kind of foreign to me to begin with. But, but basically, I said, um, I said, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to look into religion. I've tried to look into faith, and, and, just as I've heard so many times in so many different debates and arguments, is that is that ultimately uh, atheism is not a beginning point, it's an end point. It's something that, that you come to as a, a conclusion. And that's what I was telling him. I said, you know, I've, I've gone through and analyzed it. I've tried to believe it. I understand why people believe it. Um, you know, it gives them that, that warm, fuzzy feeling inside. But ultimately, if you're searching for the truth, and I am, um, then you have to face reality. And, and, then, and then anyway, our conversation went into just the very typical conversation that, that, I mean, pretty much every debate I've ever watched, he went through every single argument one by one. And, I mean, um, you know, he said, uh, he said basically that we didn't come from pond scum. We were created perfectly. Um, what else? He named about Darwin, talking about the eye, <laughs> you know, um, which was funny because about five minutes before I ran into this guy, I was listening to a debate actually online. And it was talking about how that those three lines um, taken from Darwin are so often taken out of, uh, taken out of context. Because if you continue reading, he's using that as an example to basically say, "Do not settle thinking that just because the eye seems so complex that we have to uh, ignore everything else, ignore all the other facts that support evolution, but instead keep searching and understand that 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 just because it doesn't seem logical doesn't mean that it isn't so." And um, so anyway, he took that out of context. He talked about Einstein. Um, I mean, just, just listing every single one of them left and right. Oh, don't tell me that he, he gave me the Einstein had a deathbed uh, conversion, because I've heard that song and dance before. I've heard Einstein. You know, I've heard Darwin accepted Jesus before he died. I heard Hawking right. is a believer. You know, I'm like, where do you, where you, what website are you on, man? <laughs> That's not. <laughs> I don't cool. think. I don't think. I don't think he was trying to say that 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 Einstein had a deathbed conversion or anything. But but basically, he was saying that that Einstein was Christian and a believer and this and that. And you know, where where obviously with Einstein, he claimed he was some sort of a deist. He wasn't a theist. Um, but anyway, but anyway, he went through, he went through all those different arguments. He also brought up, um, what else did he bring up? Oh, oh, so, so anyway, his whole, his whole method of argument is he would throw questions at me. He would say, so you don't think that we came from pond scum, do you? You know, you don't think that we did this. You don't think we did that. So then I would shoot back at him. I'd say, you don't think that the earth is 6,000 years old, do you? And he would say, yes, yes, it is. And, and, and I mean, he, he genuinely believes it and he's not, he's not a dumb person, but I mean, he has no concept of what the evolutionary theory states. He obviously hasn't studied it very well. He probably has heard what he's learned in church and taken it at full value. And, um, I think that's what a vast majority of them do. I was guilty for many years. For me, God was the beginning. God was a constant. And then I looked for the answers. Not once did I add up the evidence and see if God was at the end of that road. Not once did I question God for me was an absolute, and I totally understand how it could happen. i got to move on. Thank you so much for a great call. I appreciate it. Okay, great, great. Thanks. Keep it good work. If I may, let me address the Einstein thing. If anyone ever comes to you and they say, Einstein accepted Jesus on his deathbed, or Einstein invoked God, <sighs> let me read this quote. Very famous quote from Einstein himself. It was, of course, a lie what you read about my religious convictions, a lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. It is something, if something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbound admiration for the structure of the world, so far as our science can reveal it. Another uh, note very quickly on the complexity of the eye. The apologist is always saying that complexity means there is a design, which is ridiculous. And if you look 
legitimately at the arguments for the complexity of the I. Irreducible complexity is what they call it. The eye is a wondrous thing. The eye is amazing. Yeah, I get that. But it's not well designed. As I understand it, and I'm not a physician, I encourage you to check me on this, but the experts have said that there is a cluster of blood vessels right in front of the optic nerve. You know, the eye actually has to sort of hallucinate to cover the blind spot. What you see is actually inverted by the eye. The image that you see, the brain has to flip it upside down to make it look real, to make it look right. Think about how many people have to wear correction for the eye, you know? I mean, the horned owl's got much better vision than we do. Does God love the horned owl more than he does human beings? You know, the eye was evolved. In fact, it can be observed. If you want to find out about the evolution of the eye and, 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 and evolution in general, transitional fossils, many of the, uh, the bullets that the apologist likes to fire out of the gun, uh, look up a guy named Donald Pros I think it's pronounced Prothero or Prothero, P-R-O-T-H-E-R-O. -E He's written a book, and he has a great 90-minute lecture. It's actually on my YouTube page if you want to look under the favorites, where he gives specific examples of evolution happening. Transitional fossils, transitional species, they exist. And here's proof. And here's their name. And here are diagrams and photographs of what they look like. If an apologist ever comes to you and says, there are no transitional fossils, when you stop laughing, just hook them up with the good doctor, would you? i got time for a couple more. Area code 617. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Uh, yes, hi. My name is Abby. Abby, thanks for calling. What's going on? Thank you. Well, a quick comment to what you are just talking about. It that always refers, I always feel like that seems similar to me to the general, um, the human complex that we're so much more important than every other species, where there's so many other species who do things so much better than we do, and who see better than we do, who run faster than we do, who are stronger than we are, you know, and to think that, I would argue, how could God, why would God make us not perfect then, if we are quote-unquote, perfect in God's eye. As a well, the argument from the apologist is going to be that right. in our weakness, he is strong. He made us imperfect and weak so that he can then right. come in and we rely on him to be strong <laughs> and to be whole. We are but created right. with a vacuum that only God can fill. It's called the God-shaped hole. But I, wow. I understand your point, and the apologist can automatically juggle those, you know, he can juggle those chainsaws as <laughs> you know, right. the cows come home, for Pete's sake. But yeah, so the, so the argument that I was calling in to... to talk to you about was that I love it when the apologist tries to say to me, well, you know, what's the difference between my faith and your faith in science? That your your belief in science is just as well based on faith as mine is. And I feel like I don't understand how you could say that. Mine's not at all based on faith. Mine is based on knowledge and facts and information. I The only faith I possibly have is that... Uh, I believe, you know, it, I'm a physicist by uh, education, and so quantum mechanics could dictate that in any given moment I could theoretically instantaneously appear on the other side of the room and then reappear back over where I'm sitting. But the possibility, the probability actually is the best word, of course, that that's going to happen is so incredibly slim that I have faith that's not going to happen. But that's all based on mathematics and probability and science, not because I just have some innate need to believe that from inside. Have you ever heard someone tell you that atheism is a religion? It's just a religion. It's just a belief system like any other one. You guys are all yeah. religious. Right, right, exactly. And I just, to me, it's, it's always funny when someone tries to, com they, they try to say that science is is based on faith. And I feel like I don't understand why they would I mean, I've had this argument with a number of theists about saying, like, well, we, we all have faith. And it's like, well, no, yours, I feel like yours is definitely a faith based on things that you don't know, based on, whereas mine is a, a trust based in things that I do know. Based on the facts, based on experience, I don't I, know the sun's going I, to come up tomorrow morning. I can't exactly. prove that. But exactly. because of what I do know, what I can add up, what works scientifically, I can postulate that, yeah, it's a pretty good chance that sucker's going to be up here tomorrow morning about 6.30. And, yeah, I mean, come on. It's a whole different set of rules. I appreciate the call. i got to move on, okay? Take care you're of yourself. Huh, let's talk to 561. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? My name is Flo, and uh, I've been an atheist my entire life. Uh, 
the Bible, these little tales mean absolutely nothing to me. Uh, I have no sense of even how to approach people who believe this stuff. Now, I've, I've heard, I, I'm new to this podcast, and I've heard that you were a practicing Christian, and I'm fascinated. If you could give me a few minutes on how you went through deconversion, it's fascinating to me, how you were once apparently an apologist and are now a thinking, reasonable atheist. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, how could I not be an idiot and believe in Jesus uh, yeah. for 30 uh, years? It, it just, it, no offense, but yeah. Where, where, <laughs> no, it's a where, legitimate where, question. <laughs> I get it all the time. I, you know, the truth is, is that I've, I've thought about doing a video on my story. Uh, I haven't and will not immediately for a few reasons. First of all, because mm -hmm. it is still an extremely sensitive nerve with my loved ones. I, I don't want to parade mm -hmm. my family mm -hmm. in front of thousands. I feel that's, I just don't feel that's appropriate, at least in my, my measure. Uh, and secondly, I want to do it right. And I don't see a three minute video being appropriate. Um, I thought about writing it out, but I mean, I'll give you the, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. Okay. <laughs> sure thing. All right. I got to roll. I'll, I'm going to put you on mute. Did I just say the Cliff's Notes version? <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> Um, for those who've heard this before, please bear with me. I'll make it the Reader's Digest version, and I'm going to take one. I'll do two more calls, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, a special message I have prepared for the apologist. Okay? Uh, I was born into a devoutly religious home, loving, wonderful, wonderful home, intelligent. My parents are very, very smart. Okay? They are. They're smart. And they would walk through fire for their children. They are moral people. They are... Uh, I tell you, they are the kind of people that you you want on your side. They are true believers. They are both essentially theologians. And I was raised in an environment where Jesus said it, I believe it, I believe it because he said it, and I know, yes, I know, yes, I know that he's going to see it through. This is, well, I was, I was uh, uh, in Christian school from fourth grade through my senior year. I was a spokesperson for Youth for Christ. I accepted and said the salvation prayer after a revival at the age of nine. I graduated and got into Christian broadcasting for over a decade. I was a morning show host. Uh, I've shot video for, for a lot of Christian organizations in my day. And uh, I, there's no short answer as far as how the sort of the swelling of unrest came in my in my heart. But when things began to not add up, when I was in my teens and 20s, I just brushed them aside because God, again, was the beginning of the argument. I will say I don't believe I was taught critical thinking skills. I wasn't taught how to go and use a scientific method. I was taught that that's the Bible right there, baby. You put your own, just bank on it. Bank on it. I was taught the fear of hell. If you get this one wrong, you're tortured forever. Okay. And I was taught that Jesus is this wonderful, loving person who wants to come and rescue someone who desperately, desperately needs salvation. I don't deserve it. I was born a sinner, but Jesus is going to save me. But over the course of over a decade, the puzzle pieces did not fit. And maybe it has something to do with getting older. I'm 40. I'll be 43 in April, okay? My BS meter is just... I just don't tolerate it anymore. <laughs> I don't roll over anymore. I don't say, oh, we'll just let it go. I found myself thinking, I'm not going to live my entire life under someone else's umbrella of belief. I want to know what I believe, and I want to live truthfully, whatever the consequences are. So in my late 30s, I started to ask questions of the apologist, and that's why this is such a hot button for me. I started to ask legitimate questions of the experts, and you know what I got back? Garbage. The answers were laughable, if not offensive. And I thought, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's like, you know, they say when people are in a coma for a long period of time, like in the movies, they pop out of the coma, you know, and they jump up and grab the girl and save the day. <laughs> That's how it's done in, in Hollywood. It's not how it's done in the real world. Many times when people awake from a long sleep, it takes a long, long time for them to truly be lucid for them to be fully conscious. And I feel that was what it was like for me. I feel like I was asleep. 
I was fed information. I was living securely. I was resting in the notion that Jesus loves me more than anything. And I am a true creature of God who will spend eternity in heaven. And I am on a mission to make an eternal difference in this world. And it takes a long time to come out of that. Long time. And it's a tough, tough, tough road. The consequences in my own life have been significant. Significant. And I'll spare you the details. But it has cost me. (laughs) And there are so many other people out there who took a similar stand and made a similar statement and decided to live their lives truthfully. And it cost them and continues to. I'm done excusing this book. I'm done. I'm done trying to make sense of the nonsensical. I'm done. I'm going to live truthfully. If God shows up tomorrow... I promise you, I'll dump the website. I'll I'll delete every. I will print a retraction. I will I will I'll write a book. <laughs> I I will I'll pay a fine. I'll 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 make it right. Whatever is true, that's what I want. If God makes sense tonight, I promise you, you'll hear about it from me. But I've added up the science, and I've added up all of the opinions from the apologists, and I think it's total nonsense. And it has to be fought because these people are teaching other children out there who were, who are now where I was 30, 40 years ago. Programming, programming, programming. Get them while they're young. Get them while they're young. Train up a child in the way he should go. Get them while they're young. Get them before they have a chance to add things up for themselves. <sighs> Hot button. Sorry. <laughs> But I'll tell you, uh, even Michael Shermer in our interview we, we did in another podcast, which you can find on YouTube, he, he just said, intelligence has nothing to do with whether you believe in God. You, the, the, the brain is modular. We compartmentalize our belief systems. And that's how you can have conflicting, contradicting opinions and beliefs. That's how normally very intelligent people, reasonable people, that's how Francis Collins with the Human Genome Project can be a believer in God. Because the human brain is a wildly complex machine and we can compartmentalize God to play by a different set of rules. Let me tell you something right now. There are idiots everywhere on this planet. But just because someone says they believe in God does not mean they're stupid. It just doesn't. Area code 416. Hi, who's this? Hi there. That's how I is. Michael from Toronto, Canada. Michael, talk to me. What's going on? Well, I just wanted to bring to you, oh, well, first of all, to say thank you, Seth, for being you and putting the YouTube channel up and giving us guys out here who sometimes stand in the bleak loneliness of being an atheist some sort of reason to continue to talk to people about their delusion. Um, one of the things I just wanted to say was, how can it be that everything must have a creator while God must not? You know, the, con- the contradiction in that is uh, is palpable. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention. You may know you may know of this place, but some of our, our uh, the other listeners may not. Uh, that's a website called GodIsImaginary.com. Um, there are 50 proofs there uh, about the reason why God does not exist, and. Uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention and say thanks for being there and uh, thanks for their, uh, thanks for being there for all of us. You are a tremendous encouragement to me. I sure appreciate it. You take care of yourself, okay? Thank you, sir. Let me finish with a particular pet peeve of my own and a message to the apologist. You know, there are the Kent Hovens of the world who are uber-liberal and uber-literal with Scripture. You know, they say, it is what it is. Boom. What it says is true. I've noticed that many defenders of Scripture continue to have to abridge and alter, to change and excuse Bible truths when confronted with real science. You ever heard any of these? Science says the Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. Apologists stretch their six-day creation story to say that, well, they weren't literal days. One million years to us is like a single day to God. Science says there's no geological evidence to support the idea of a global flood. None. Apologists stretch the flood story to say, well, it, w- it wasn't necessarily a global flood. Or if you're Hoven, you say the entire geologic column is a conspiracy of science to kill God. When you point out scriptures like the one in Exodus, chapter 21, verses 20 and 21, it says, when a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod so hard that the slave dies under his hand, he shall be punished. 
If, however, the slave survives for a day or two, he is not to be punished since the slave is his own property. Yeah, God endorsed the slavery and instructed on how hard you can beat your slave. The apologists stretch and argue that it was a different time. It wasn't true slavery back then. It was simply indentured servanthood. Okay, you get to beat the crap out of your servant. And if they get up after a couple of days, <laughs> it's all good. That's God's law. When you speak about Joshua conquering the city of Jericho, this is a story they told us as kids. And he quote the scripture directly, Joshua 6.21, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox, and sheep, and ass with the edge of the sword. Meaning God's soldiers plunged swords into the beating hearts of babies. The apologists stretch, making the argument, and I am not making this up, that the babies were not human. They were the offspring of the Nephilim. <laughs> I just don't, I mean, what do you do with this? The word Nephilim is a transliteration of a Hebrew word related to the verb Nephel. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. It means to fall. And it's often interpreted to mean the aborted ones. The King James Version translate Nephilim as giants. So depending on which expert you talk to, you're hearing the excuse that fallen angels had sex with human women here on the earth, and their offspring were Nephilim children, children of the giants of Canaan, not human. And therefore, when they drove the sword into the beating heart of the baby, it wasn't infanticide. They were demon killers. Want to have some fun? Ask the apologist how Nephilim, who were apparently around before Adam and Eve, if you read Genesis 6-4, how they survived Noah's flood. <laughs> they were here on the earth before the flood? Okay, Noah and his family were the only ones saved? Okay, how in the world were there Nephilim in Jericho if they were all wiped out beforehand? Put 50 experts, quote-unquote, in a room and get them to agree with each other on any one of these questions, hell, is it a literal place of fire and damnation? Or is it just separation from God? Salvation, is it eternal? Is it guaranteed? Once saved, always saved? Are God's children guaranteed good health on this earth? Are God's children supposed to be humble and poor or prosperous and wealthy? Is the Bible literally true or is it metaphor? Parables, a guide. How valid are the Dead Sea Scrolls? What about the books of the Bible that weren't canonized for the final version? <laughs> the original ones that man decided they just aren't quite qualified. What do you do with those? Are they valid? Is heaven a place we have not ever seen? Or will the new earth become heaven after Jesus comes? Do you receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, or do you have to ask for the Holy Spirit separately? The list goes on and on. Put the experts in a room. Ask them the basics. Watch them chew each other to ribbons over the details. I want to finish the show with a short message I have written specifically, addressed to the apologist, the defender of faith, the expert, the advocate of God's holy book. It reads like this. Dear sir or ma'am, I understand. I understand how fulfilling it must be to champion your belief system so bravely, so publicly, so passionately. And I understand the attraction of believing that the purpose of your life is to rescue the unsaved and unwashed from eternal hellfire and damnation. This charge from God projects meaning onto your life. You are a superhero. You're here to save us. And the consequences of this fight are eternal, so the stakes could not be higher. Sounds like a movie. I mean, who wouldn't want to believe it? To own the idea that their lives were a quest. My king has commanded me to vanquish my foes and take his message to the farthest reaches of the kingdom. And upon completion of this task, he will reward me with praise, with riches, with security, happiness, and health without end. 
For so many, the idea of eternal purpose is the only reason life would be worth living. I mean, after all, if science proved we came from stardust, if our lives were a product of a singular event which set the entire universe in motion 14 billion years ago, if we occupied a tiny speck on a tiny solar system in a single galaxy, alongside hundreds of billions of other galaxies inside a vast universe, and we learned that our lives are natural and not supernatural, it would mean that there was no divine intervention, no miracles, no mission, no life after death, no mansions, no pearly gates, no streets of gold, no existence beyond the grave. It would mean that you would have to face life on your own. You would have to find purpose in the concrete, not in the abstract. You couldn't thank God for the wonderful elements in your life, nor could you blame Satan for the terrible ones. You'd have to acknowledge a meager existence in a universe that simply doesn't care that you exist. And you'd have to face death without the happy ending of eternal bliss in the heavens. I believe the apologist's defense of the superstitious, the irrational, the atrocious, the laughable, and the false betray for some a tremendous sense of insecurity about life and death. For others, it's an opportunity to cash in, to feed egos, to sell books, to look down at the huddled masses and operate from a position of authority, wisdom, and power. And while I know there are many Bible defenders out there who are indeed humble in spirit, I've also seen many runaway egos whose love for themselves outweighs any love for God. Now, sure, who wouldn't want to feel smarter, more enlightened, more educated, more inspired, more right than everyone else? But you should know something in my own quest for answers and in my own rejection of the Christian faith I was raised in. It was ultimately the apologist who finally convinced me that there is no God. It was the apologist and his explanations, his equivocations, his alterations, his incredible feats of acrobatics that helped me to realize that the Bible defies history, it defies logic, it defies morality, it defies common sense, it defies everything that you wish to defend. Finally, it was the mere idea that God's message to all men, women, and children with eternal salvation in the balance would require some theological egghead to come in and explain its meaning. <laughs> that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Right now, fallible human parents are sending perfectly understandable, clearly worded messages, letters, email, whatever, to their children sometimes on the other side of the world, human beings. And in their messages, there's no question, there's no ambiguity. The message is plain. And yet, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-understanding, wondrous and omnipotent God of the universe, who loves us more than anything, wants to communicate to his beloved children through a 2,000-year-old book that is so vague, so nonsensical, so desperate for defense and explanation, that it requires a human being like you to help us figure it out? Nonsense. Ultimately, it was you, the apologist, that helped convince me of what I was the day I was born and what I know and embrace at this moment with every fiber of my being. To you, the apologist, you should know that you convinced me, you convinced me that I'm an atheist. And for the first time in my life, everything is starting to make sense. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com